you are called to live an uncommon life. As a follower of Jesus, your life should not be able to be described as common. The way that you operate, the things that you do, the way that you love people and treat people and steward your life and everything in it should not be common. We have this calling from an uncommon God, a God who loves us, who draws near to us, who forgives us, a God who laid his life down for us, a God who invites us to eternity with him forever and to experience his abundance today. We have an uncommon God who has given us an uncommon calling to live an uncommon life. And if we're honest, that is not easy to do. In a world and a cultural climate always trying to deter you, defeat faith, to tempt you into the common things, it can be very, very hard to live that uncommon life. I've been thinking about this life we're called to that we've been talking about. And I think one of the main things that we desperately need as followers of Jesus is uncommon strength. That's what I wanna talk about today, uncommon strength. I'm glad you guys are fired up about that. <laughs> we are told all through the Bible to be strong, to be strong in our faith, strong in the Lord. David, he writes all through the Psalms, this is a man who is going through all kinds of ups and downs and battles. Psalm 99, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Psalm 18:32, it is God who gives me strength and makes my path perfect. Psalm 27, one, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Isaiah 26, four, trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Ephesians 6, one, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I think Psalm 73, 26, this verse really maybe illustrates the challenge of this for us, it says, my flesh and my heart may fail. I think we all can relate to that. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 360 times the Bible brings up strength, tells us to be these unshakable, immovable objects for the kingdom of God to be established in his strength. But that's really hard to do. I think more days in my faith journey have I felt weak than I have felt strong. And there's even good news in your weakness. It's God's strength that comes through and makes you strong in your weakness, but it's if you let him, let him be your strength. In the Bible, as we're kind of on this journey of, I wanna be strong in my faith, I wanna be a strong follower of Jesus, we find that the source of our strength comes from a very uncommon place, at least to me. Nehemiah chapter eight, verse 10, the last piece of this verse, we love it, you've probably seen it on a coffee cup. It says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The source of our strength is the joy of the Lord. That's what the word of God says. That has always sounded awesome and very odd to me. It would make more sense if that verse said, the strength of the Lord, that's your strength. The power of the Lord, the might of the Lord, that's your strength. But the word joy is what's used here. It's the joy of the Lord that is your strength. I think all of us want to live a life filled with joy. And we hear that verse, we talk about joy around Christmas time and we're all like, yeah, I want some of that. How do I get it? How do I experience and live in the joy of the Lord? It feels like this feeling that we're chasing. It's very hard to find. I believe that we have a desperate need. The world desperately needs a strong church with strong believers, which means we need to be filled with the joy of the Lord. There's some times where I, make some jokes and take some shots at you, Sunday morning people. It bothers me that so many people rush out of here when the sermon ends and worship's starting again, rush to the parking lot. There's times where we're preaching and it's a full room and we're kind of like, hey, could you guys like each set a timer and every 30 seconds, just smile at me. <laughs> just let me know that you're paying attention and that this actually matters and you're excited to be here for a second. And I've realized that really what's deep down in me is I look around at the church, I look around at our church and I feel grieved because I see so many people who seem to have no joy of the Lord. Who don't seem to be filled with this overflowing joy to, to want to get to worship Jesus and experience his presence. And you didn't ask my advice, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway. I love that you're here, and if this is the only service you can make it to, come on. 
But if because you come to this service, you have to rush out of here and get to the parking lot before worship's over, come to a different service. Don't forfeit worship for convenience. Don't miss out on the opportunity to be in the presence of God and be filled with his joy. And I get it. I've been the guy in church that's kind of like, what's everybody doing? What's going on around here? I remember when I was new, I kind of like on the fringes of faith, I went on a mission trip and I was around all these Christian people and I was kind of like, what's wrong with all you guys? Everybody's so happy, kind of annoying. Don't you know that life sucks? We're in an impoverished country and all of these followers of Jesus living with nothing are so filled with joy. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? You shouldn't be joyful, look at your life. And in me was this war because I was trying to find this well of joy and I didn't have it. It was really helpful early in my faith. Somebody explained to me the difference between happiness and joy. I'd never really heard it explained that way. Happiness, this is from like a psych brain science perspective. Happiness comes from your sympathetic nervous system. That's where it activates. And it's associated with excitement, energy, and activity. But joy comes from your parasympathetic nervous system and it promotes feelings of calm and peace. It's a deeper well than just a feeling. It's a way of life. One of the main differences between joy and happiness is joy can coexist with negative emotions. Happiness has a very hard time doing so. That was my life. If you in that time, when I was a college student trying to figure out what I believed, if you could have taken a scan of my sympathetic nervous system and my parasympathetic nervous system, you'd look at my sympathetic nervous system like the happy, happiness area and it would look like a guy who had to go run two marathons back to back with no training. Just like, we're going for it over here. <laughs> any activity, any excitement, anything that brings about a little hit of happiness, like we'll get it. We're going for it. Well, my parasympathetic nervous system probably would have looked like, I don't even know if this guy knows I'm here. <laughs> I was talking to Ryan about this time in my life. He's like, it's weird hearing you describe kind of that turmoil in you because I never would have described you as anything but a happy person. And I said, yeah, I think that I felt happy a lot, but I was not joyful. I'm really good at having fun. I love to have fun. I love to laugh. I love to have a good time. I'm an Enneagram seven. <laughs> and I was really good. I majored in getting hits of happiness in college. Like I could feel happy. I could find ways to feel happy, but deep down in me, there was no joy, calm, peace. That wasn't the life that I had. What I've realized and learned is we as human beings are always trying to feel happy. But God wants us to be joyful. Not chasing a feeling, but living with a deep well of joy that he has for us. Because let's be real, life is hard. We have a lot of trials and things we go through and it is the joy of the Lord that is your strength through those things. Psychologist George Valent says, talking about joy, without the pain of farewell, there is no joy of reunion. And without the pain of captivity, we don't experience the joy of freedom. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart for Jesus has overcome the world. Let his joy sustain you through the trials. It's a deep place. I love what he said, and it was also a perfect segue into the story we're gonna read in scripture today. Nehemiah chapter eight which is the story of a bunch of people who were in captivity who are now experiencing the joy of freedom and trying to figure out what to do with it. And we hear that verse, that piece of that verse from Nehemiah chapter eight, and it's like, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You're like, cool, put it on a t-shirt. Is anybody living with it though? How do we get it? How do we do it? And I hope that this message is not about chasing a feeling, but that it's helpful for you, that it's practical for you. Because when we read this whole story, I think we actually get a great blueprint of how to live in the joy of the Lord and let it be our strength. Now we've hopped around the Old Testament a lot the last couple of weeks. And I know when you read the Old Testament, it's kind of like the Lord of the Rings books where you're like, there's too many names to keep track of. And where are we in the story? There's so many moving parts. I can't keep up. So here's your refresher. The Old Testament is the story of God making us, us choosing sin to walk away from him and his, hand, his plan hatched to redeem us. And he does it through this family turned nation called Israel these people that are called to be uncommon people so that the world can see their uncommon God through them. He's called them to live differently and through them, he's going to do the most uncommon thing you could ever imagine that God would do and send himself in human flesh to pay the price for our sins to be our savior from this family. And this family, they come out of freedom in Egypt and they wander in the wilderness. 
slaves now in freedom, wandering and eventually find their home and establish themselves a kingdom. And they've got a lot of bad kings and a lot of ups and downs. And this people called to be uncommon continually actually looks so common as they wander from God and get pulled into the ways and worship of the world. And they're wandering, their common temptations lead them eventually to the point that they are exiles in Babylon. This powerful empire takes them out of their home and makes them captives, slaves to them. We're talking about people that were captives that watched God set them free and walk across the Red Sea. And later in their history, they find their way back into captivity. Isn't that the human story? God will set us free and somehow we will find ourselves those chains again. Now, while they're in captivity in Babylon, they start to get the opportunity for some people to return back and establish their home, to reestablish, rebuild themselves. About 60, 70 years into the captivity, a man named Zerubbabel goes back and his job is to rebuild the temple, the place of worship of their uncommon God. And then Ezra is this priest. And about 60 years after that, he gets to go. And his job is to restore the law, the uncommon calling on these people, to put that mantle back onto this nation. And about 10, 13 years after him, Nehemiah, his partner in crime, a governor, he goes back to Jerusalem and his job is to rebuild the wall of the city, to rebuild the infrastructure, rebuild the actual place that these people used to live in. Now, where we enter the story in Nehemiah chapter eight, phase one is complete. They have rebuilt the wall. And it's been a journey because there's some other nations, some other people surrounding that don't like these uncommon people and they don't like their uncommon God and they feel very threatened that they're coming back home. But in spite of that, they rebuild. Phase one is complete, but here comes phase two. The more important part, they've rebuilt the city. Now it's time to rebuild the people. A people weakened. A people who were captives with a lot of pain, a lot of brokenness. It's time to rebuild the people of God. So they gather in Nehemiah chapter eight, they gather together for kind of like a church service. 50,000 people come together. It's like everybody that's back in Jerusalem. Could you imagine you launch a church? How many people showed up to your church launch? 50,000. I think you guys are gonna do pretty well. (laughs) You're off to a good start. They're all gathered together and we're gonna read the, the moment, the service, where they are when they hear that the joy of the Lord is their strength. I'm gonna read you this whole chapter and I'm gonna ask all of you if you are able to stand for the reading of the word of God. As in like, stand up. (laughs) That is the one part of this sermon I didn't think I'd have to explain. (laughs) Don't groan about this because you're gonna feel bad a few verses in. You're gonna be like, ah, I shouldn't have complained. We get the last piece of chapter seven when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns. Nehemiah chapter eight, verse one. All the people came together as one in the square before the Watergate. Has nothing to do with Richard Nixon and Watergate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which, is, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So the law, that's their scriptures. For us, it's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's where your Bible and a year plan goes to die. This is their scriptures. It's the law. It's their story, their origin story, their uncommon calling. It's all of that. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. That's like six hours. I don't ever want to get crap for preaching too long. (laughs) Just reading the Bible, six hours. I lost my place. (laughs) He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. When the Bible says something twice, which it just did, That's a bold, that's an exclamation point. It says the men, women, and anyone who could understand were all there. Normally in a gathering, it would be the leaders who were the male leaders of the culture. But in this moment, everybody is together. Men, women, youth, everybody's there. This is a monumental moment for this nation. They haven't done something like this in probably 150 years. And everybody is there. This is mind blowing. All the people listen attentively to the book of the law. Can you imagine a church service where everybody pays attention? Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood a list of names of his guys that I'm not gonna read right now for the sake of time. I totally know how to pronounce all of them. Ezra, (laughs) verse five, opened the book. He opened the book. And all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. They all stood up just like you. (laughs) Hours 
just listening to the word of God. Ezra praised the Lord. He praised the great God and all the people lifted their hands and responded, amen, amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, another list of names, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. I'm gonna get to heaven. Those guys will be like, you wouldn't even read my name. You know, I worked really hard for the same kingdom you did. (laughs) They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so the people understood what was being read. They have small groups. They have these leaders who go and explain the word to them, help them understand what they're reading. Some of these people have never heard a lot of this. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to your Lord, to your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Like imagine if right now I look around and you're all just crying. Nehemiah said this, here's the famous verse, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people saying, be still for this is a holy day, do not grieve. What a day. Then all the people went away to eat and drink and send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. They now get it. So they go and they celebrate. Listen to the next day. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and Levites, gathered around Ezra, the teacher of the law, to give attention to the words of the law. This is like when you get that momentum when you start working out again. You're like, I'm getting back to the gym tomorrow and the next day. And they're like, get us in the word. We need more of this. You guys are like, you gotta stop talking between verses, dude. This is, we're gonna be standing forever. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month. There's about to be a festival they're supposed to celebrate. It's gonna sound weird, I'll explain it in a second. That they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Hey, we've read the word, what do we do? We gotta go tell everybody what the word says. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God and in the square by the water gate and the one by the gate of Ephraim. The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. Listen to this, from the days of Joshua, son of Nun, it's almost a thousand years before this, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. Please be seated. And well done. Andrew, welcome. Ryan told me last night, you burned twice as many calories standing than sitting and so I just made you all stronger. Congratulations. (laughs) It's such a poignant moment for this nation, for these people. They all gather together and Ezra just opens up the book. He just starts reading scripture to them and it moves the people. They have small groups, people explaining it. They're they're getting the word of God. It's speaking to them and it's leading them in some directions as they're hearing the word. It leads them to worship. They fall on their faces and just start worshiping God. They're led to worship. They're also led to conviction, repentance. Maybe you've been in church and something from the word of God speaks and you go, oh, how far I've wandered from God. And it grieves you. I know that feeling well. It grieves you when you realize I walked away from him into exile, into the common things, into the world, away from his plan for my life. So they're feeling that, but Nehemiah stops them. He looks around at everyone weeping and he goes, hey, we're not walking out of here today with grief. We're walking out of here with joy. Nehemiah is rebuilding a nation and he wants these people rebuilt strong. A weakened people rebuilt with the strength that is the joy of the Lord. He's looking at these people and they're weeping and he goes, hey, I know our story. But ultimately our story is not about how bad we were, it's about how good God is. We're not gonna walk out of here with grief. We're gonna walk out of here with joy because I don't know if you've all noticed, but we were exiles and we are home now. We are going to celebrate the goodness of our God. And they leave there and they go and they celebrate and then they get that momentum. They want more, they get back into the word. And and what you see in them that strikes is obedience. Obedience and joy go hand in hand. We like to keep those things separated. They go together. 
they read from the word of God and they realize that there's a festival coming up and they're supposed to celebrate it. They had these times during the year, these people where they would celebrate the things that God had done, commemorate the goodness of their God. And this festival, the festival of the booths, they literally would make little shelters and they'd live in them during the festival. It was to commemorate that they have such an uncommon God that when their people were wandering in the wilderness, their God chose to put his presence into a tent and travel with them. A God who is so personal that wants so badly to be with his people that he traveled with them in a little shelter. And so they commemorate that and they celebrate unlike they have in nearly a thousand years. What we find in this story is joy is not some fleeting feeling you grab at. Joy is a decision. Nehemiah commands them. He says, you're going to choose joy today. You are not going to walk out of here focused on your failure. You're going to walk out of here focused on the victory of God in your life. It's like if someone was in church and I saw them and they were weeping, they're grieving and they're feeling repentance, I'd go, that's healthy and needed. If you're feeling that conviction. But I'm not going to let you walk out of here with the story in your mind being how guilty you are. I'm gonna make sure you know the whole story that you have actually been forgiven and set free by the blood of Jesus and you should walk out and get in your car and be ready to celebrate that while you walked away, God was faithful. And this story is so practically to me, it gives us some conceptual ways to wrap our arms around how do I live with the joy of the Lord? How can I be a strong believer? As we see what starts to fill up their joy tank, that's what I'll call it. I wanna illustrate the joy tank to you or joy bucket through the things that are filling it up in this story. The word, worship, repentance, and celebration. Very practical spiritual disciplines that are the things that start filling up the joy in them to strengthen them. This whole thing, the catalyst that ignites this whole thing is just opening up the word of God, just hearing the word of God, reading it. Because to a people that are broken and confused, the word of God brings them clarity and identity and calling. The word of God doesn't just inform us, it transforms us. It is alive and active. It starts welling up in them the knowledge of who their God is and what he's done and who they are called to be. And it starts cultivating and filling them with this joy that leads them to worship. Worship is this beautiful place of humility and intimacy with God. This unique experience where you get to be in his presence and be with him. I heard a pastor say, what you sing about, you bring about. And I think a lot of us aren't bringing about the joy of the Lord in our lives because we won't sing about him. I, I know that in church, we very often are like, worship is not just singing a few songs on a Sunday morning. It's a posture of life. And that's correct. That is true. But I think a lot of us use that as an excuse to go, yeah, I don't sing. I don't worship in church. I, I, I worship when I wake surf. That's how I worship. That's my way of worshiping. I'm like, that's awesome. I feel God there too on the lake. But it is very clear in scripture that we are called as the people of God to come together and worship him. I think some of you are not experiencing the joy of the Lord because you simply won't open your mouth and praise him. Repentance, repentance is kind of the one on here that you're like, if repentance and joy walk into a dinner party, they're not gonna talk to each other. <laughs> they don't get along because we mistakenly think that repentance is when you get put in timeout. Go feel bad about yourself. When it's actually repentance that brings about freedom and joy in our lives. Repentance is where you shine a light on the common things, on the sin in your life, the things that are robbing you, that are draining your joy tank. And you find freedom from those things. When you disobey God, you forfeit joy. Sin is not bad because it's against the rules. Sin is against the rules because it's bad because it drains your joy tank, because it takes life from you, it weakens you, and God knows that. Thomas Aquinas said, no one can live without delight. And that, that desire in all of us, because God made us, we want to experience joy. That is why a man deprived of spiritual joy goes over to carnal pleasures. That was me in college. I wanna be happy, I wanna feel happy. I want to delight. I want some of that in my life. I don't have any spiritual joy in me, so what will I do? I will grab at all the worldly common things, and as I do, for some reason, feel emptier and emptier and emptier. Void of joy. We can relate to these people because we've all wandered from God, and it grieves us, and it should, but our ultimate takeaway should be the joy of the Lord 
that fills us with strength, to be rebuilt. People who are weakened by the world, weakened by common things, weakened by sin, but re rebuilt with the strength that is the joy of the Lord of what he's done. And that's where this whole thing leads is to celebration. If the word is the thing that kind of ignites this whole thing, celebration is what makes it start overflowing. Takes the spark and turns it into a wildfire. I love the fruit that you see of their celebration as this gratitude. That's what celebration does. It brings gratitude about of who God is. And the overflow of it is generosity and proclamation. You hear it said that they're told and they go and they share food and drinks with those who don't have. This overflowing, hey, we're partying and you're gonna party too. Here you go, what do you need? We're celebrating our God, you're invited. Proclamation, sharing their faith. They read the word and go, we gotta go tell everybody what the word says. It's a good litmus test in your faith. Our generosity and sharing your faith, are they pillars of your life? And if they are, do you tend to operate in generosity or sharing your faith out of obligation or celebration? Because if it's out of obligation, it's an I have to, then I think you're missing out on the joy of the Lord, the overflowing joy where you just can't help it. There's two types of joy from a psych perspective. Passive joy is a kind of contentment with the way things currently are. I think that's most people, most Christians even. Like things are good, God is good, so I'm good, and that's, that's good. But active joy is wanting to share your experience of joy with others. It's where it starts overflowing out of you. Like you can't help it, you can't stop it. It's like the disciples, Acts 4.20 has always been a life verse for us. Where these men are being threatened, they're going to be killed if they will not stop talking about Jesus. And they turn to the people that are threatening them and they go, hey, you can do what you want, but for us, we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. We won't. We have seen the goodness of our God, that Jesus came here. We watched him go to the cross and walk out of a tomb and we will never stop talking about it. We are too filled with his joy to, to stop talking about it. We just tend to approach the things that I believe will bring about joy, that will fill that tank. We approach them backwards. We say, I'm gonna do those things if I feel it. So I showed up to church and just felt like I was in a good mood. So I actually, I lifted my hands and I worshiped. Like, that's awesome. I love that you did. A great moment. My hope is that your faith will deepen and mature to the point that you will do that exact same thing on your worst day. I woke up and I was just kind of feeling it, so I read a little bit of the Bible and it was good. Awesome, I'm so glad you're in the word of God. But I would love and encourage you to make that a daily habit, not based on whether you're feeling it or not, because it's doing those things that will lead you to feel and experience and live a life of joy. But most of us don't experience much of it because we wait till we feel it when it's those things that will make us feel it. This just works. I feel like pretty much every sermon I preach is some way of being like, read the Bible and worship God. <laughs> That's what you do. Because it works. Here's why it works. When you are living a life in the word, worshiping God, in repentance, celebration, man, it's there that you are walking in step with the spirit. It's there where you are letting the spirit lead you through the word that is alive and active and speak to you and teach you and guide you. It's the spirit leading you in worship for this intimate encounter with God where you get to experience his presence, where the things of heaven fall on you, the supernatural encounter with God. It's in repentance that the Holy Spirit rebukes and corrects you and takes you from a common life, a life of grief, and brings you back to freedom and ultimately to celebration. You know, joy is the number two fruit of the spirit. Galatians 5 gives you the fruits of the Spirit, of what living, walking with the Spirit, the fruit it produces in your life. And joy is number two. Now, I realize that list is not a competition, but if it is, <laughs> joy is number two on the power rankings. Right under love, which is the obvious number one. The Holy Spirit wants to fill you with joy. I think of it like this. In every human being, there is a seed of joy planted in you when you're born, because you're made in the image of God. And it's through watering with the word and worship, repentance and celebration, watering that seed that it begins to grow into fruit that bears in your life. I can't think of the moment in my story when it was like that day, the joy of the Lord just struck in me. It was a process, it was a filling, it was a journey of starting to walk away from the common way I was living into an uncommon life of being led by the spirit, letting Jesus lead me. But I have to caution you, 
When you fill up something with water and then you leave it and you come back another day or two later, there will be less water in it because it evaporates. And so it is, I believe, with joy. That, that's why we have to daily fill up the tank because common things will pull us away from it and we'll come back and there'll be less. It will deplete as we go try to find hits of happiness through worldly things instead of going to the source of joy that is Jesus. And Jesus, I think it's important that we all hear this, Jesus wants joy for you. He wants that tank full. A lot of people didn't grow up in a church that said that. Jesus wants joy for you. God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. It was actually joy that led a lot of people to reject Jesus. A lot of people didn't like that about him. Celebration is kind of one of those things that the people who take themselves too seriously, the religious, the Pharisee, they reject it. In the same way the rebel rejects repentance, the Pharisee rejects celebration. Celebration is a spiritual discipline. I love our friends at Celebration Church because they named their church Celebration Church. Because we're gonna walk out of here when we get together, we're gonna walk out of here celebrating. Our church is named after an amphitheater in Colorado. Good for us. <laughs> Hyper-spiritual people. A lot of us grew up in church kind of telling us that Jesus is just kind of frustrated. Like, oh, these freaking people. Ugh. Why are you smiling? Stop being happy. You're supposed to be holy, right? We don't perceive Jesus as joyful, but we should because while he was the man of sorrows, he's also the man of joy. He was rejected for it. In Luke chapter seven, he calls it out. He was talking to the Pharisees and he looks at them and he goes, you know, my cousin John the Baptist was this pious, serious man, lived a very difficult, holy life. And you all said, he's a little too extreme for us. He's probably got a demon. But here I come, the son of man eating and drinking, and you look at me and go, that man is a glutton and a drunk, parties with sinners. That was Jesus' reputation. That's why the Pharisees rejected him. That's, that's the heart of a Pharisee. They will find a problem with everybody except himself. That guy's too extreme that way, that guy's too extreme that way, that way. And I think what Jesus is trying to teach them is taking yourself too seriously is actually spiritual weakness. It's weakness in your faith. Even preparing this message a few weeks ago, I was trying to start thinking about like, what's an uncommon thing that I wanna challenge our church in? And this just, this scripture just, I was like, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Like we need to be challenged in our, our joy so that we can be strong. And I was kind of resisting it because I was like, ah, but you know those people that are gonna be like, oh, talking about joy this week, kind of a light week, kind of a week off. Not gonna, not gonna eat meat this week. We're just talking about joy, kind of this feeling. Okay. And I was having this debate of like, ah, maybe there's something else I should challenge our people in. And then we got a gift and in it was a bag of coffee. This is the very day that I'm like having this debate. And the name of the coffee bag is Joy of the Lord is Your Strength. <laughs> and it has Nehemiah chapter eight, verse 10 written on the coffee. Now, most of the time when people are like, I got a sign from God. I'm like, no, you didn't. <laughs> uh, too skeptical sometimes, but also, you know, like we can all relate on that. You're like, no, I think you just wanted to ask that person out. That's fine. <laughs> but God knows that I'm not super smart. And so I think there's times where he's kind of like, I'm gonna make this very obvious for you. <laughs> I want you to challenge your church in joy because I want you to build a strong church. And the Pharisees missed it. I think that attitude about joy, that it's light, that it's shallow. What it reveals is what it revealed in the Pharisees that they were very strong in knowledge and yet so spiritually weak. They were so weak spiritually, why? Because they had no joy. They, they saw it as shallow and superficial. They had a problem with Jesus and his joy. Hebrews chapter one, verse nine. It quotes back to Psalm 45 and it says that Jesus came, the Messiah, that he showed up here and he was anointed, which means filled with, a pouring in. He was filled up with the oil of joy. Another place where joy pops up and you're like, that's the word. Because Jesus could be, it could say the anointed with the oil of love or of sacrifice, forgiveness, but he is anointed, it says, with the oil of joy. In Luke chapter four, Jesus is in a synagogue and he opens up Isaiah 61 and he reads it and goes, this is me, I'm him. I'm who this prophecy is talking about, I'm the Messiah. 
And in that prophecy, it says that he would come and he would be anointed with the oil of joy, not mourning. That he would be known as a man of joy. The angel shows up in the Christmas story of Luke chapter two. I bring good news that will bring great joy to all the people. And I think it's one of those things we hear maybe once a year at Christmas time, like, oh yeah, we're supposed to be joyful because of Jesus. And then the next day we're frustrated with our family, like get me through the Christmas season. And two weeks later, you're like, man, is that good news bringing any joy to your life at all? Because it should. And Jesus wants it for you. He's at the last supper with his disciples. Probably one of the most heavy, somber moments in history. And at this dinner, he's telling them, hey, I am the vine and you are the branches. You have to abide in me. You are about to go live very uncommon lives, starting the church. You're gonna be persecuted. You need to abide in me. That is going to be the key. And he says in verse nine, as the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. That's why God tells you what to do because he wants you to remain in his love. Just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. He's, listen to this. I have told you this so that my joy may be complete in you, may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That's what he wants is completed joy in you, a filling of his joy. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're about to walk into an uncommon life. You're, need, you're gonna need to be strong. You need to be filled with my joy. And Jesus goes first. He does exactly what he just said. He lays his life down for his friends the very next day. Doug started this series off, Hebrews chapter 12. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we have a lineage, a heritage of such strong people of faith. Let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Go live that uncommon life. How do we do that? Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Listen to this. Jesus, who for the joy set before him, the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Man, if you're growing weary, if your life is full of trials, if you're suffering, if you're in pain right now, consider Jesus, consider him, what he did, that he endured on the cross for you, that he can relate to you in your pain, consider him another place where joy pops up. And I'm like, that's the thing. What was it that was Jesus' incentive? What propelled him to endure the cross? Love, forgiveness, sure, yes, of course. But this verse tells us it was the joy set before Jesus. The joy before him, what awaited him. And you ask yourself, well, what was that? Like, what's the joy that was set before Jesus? Because Jesus didn't have to do this for him. Jesus had it pretty good. He was up in heaven. There's a lot of joy. And he stepped out and came down into this mess and gave his life, paid the price for your sin and mine to redeem exiles lost in sin, people in captivity to bring us to freedom, to bring us home to him. What pushed him to do that? It was the joy set before him. What is that? It's eternity with you. Eternity with us. The joy that awaited it's one of the beautiful things you find out in scripture is that heaven, the, like everything after this, eternity, is not actually, as much as I love the word of God, it's not all of us standing forever just listening to someone read the Bible. Eternity is a story there is complete and now we spend the rest of eternity celebrating that story. In Revelation, you find out what it looks like. It's a wedding reception. It's the wedding supper of the lamb. That's what eternity looks like is a party, a celebration. That song, Joy to the World, was not actually written about Christmas. It was written about the second coming of Jesus. It was written about the reality that he will return and he will restore and he will make all things new and we will be in eternity celebrating with him forever. And it's described like a wedding. He is the groom. I officiated a wedding for my friends Austin and Heather the other night. And I can tell you, Austin, the groom, his posture at the wedding wasn't like frustrated with his brand new wife. That's not what a groom looks like on his wedding day. There was a point at which I was like, bro, you need to take some deep breaths. I think you're having an out-of-body experience right now. Like you are so overcome with feeling and emotion and joy in the moment. That's what a groom is like. Here's a picture of me on my wedding day. Yeah, you didn't know how athletic I am. I have a five-foot vertical. I've never jumped that high before that moment. I never have since. My knees can't take it now. That was 10 years ago today. 
You can, you can clap for my wife. She deserves the applause. Imagine those 10 years. The Lord said, and Stephanie will suffer for my name. <laughs> That's what a groom looks like. Overjoyed. We just don't picture Jesus like that. But that's his posture. He is the man of joy and he wants it for you. But you're not gonna find it in common ways and getting worldly hits of happiness. You will only find it in Jesus. A woman named Leslie Weatherhead said, the opposite of joy is not sorrow, it is unbelief. You can have joy in the sorrow. But if you don't believe in the source of joy, then you will not access it. You will spend your life trying to get hits of happiness, counterfeits, Something so uncommon about our God to me is just laughter, fun, joy. Skeptics and atheists, they can't really explain it. Like we're accidental matter. Why do we laugh? Why do we have fun? Why do we celebrate? Why do we feel joy? They can't explain it. There's many philosophers who have had to conclude that laughter is too complex to explain. They don't have an answer. One of those, Willie Cypher, this guy, he said, we don't really know what laughter is or what causes it. We do. An uncommon God, filled with joy. G.K. Chesterton said, I've often thought the gigantic secret of God is his mirth, which means amusement, joy, fun. That's the secret. The Pharisees couldn't figure that secret out. That's why they were spiritually weak and dead. And God wants joy for you. He wants to strengthen you in joy, even to the point, here's the crazy thing, joy makes you physically stronger. Someone studying it said, laughter that has joy as its sources is vital to the health of the soul as it is to the health of the body because they knew the health that joy brings to the body. Here's the side effects of laughter. It boosts your immune system, lowers stress hormones, decreases pain, relaxes your muscles, prevents heart disease, counteracts anxiety and tension, improves mood and strengthens overall resilience because God designed it that way, that you would be literally healthier and stronger when you laugh, when you feel joy, when you're filled with the joy of the Lord, it makes you physically stronger, it makes you emotionally stronger. I love this quote from an author, Elton Trueblood. He says, the well-known humor of the Christian is not a way of denying the tears, but rather a way of affirming something which is deeper than tears. That's what Nehemiah wants to tell the people. There's something deeper than your grief right now. It's the joy of the Lord. It's deeper. Joy is not superficial. Joy is supernatural. And it's an internal thing. 90% of joy in your life is internally dictated. That's what psychologists will tell you. It has very little to do actually with your external circumstances. Happiness depends on those things. Happiness depends on your circumstances. Joy depends on your God. That's why in James chapter one, James can say, consider it pure joy when you face trials of all kinds. And we're all like, shut up, James. <laughs> I'm going through it right now. He goes, consider it pure joy. How can you say that? Well, for one, when you watched your own brother endure the cross because of the joy that was set before him. And when you are living a life being persecuted for your faith, but enduring and realizing that joy comes from the experience we have that when we discover that in the spite of trials and stresses and hardship and suffering and persecution, the faithfulness of God outlasts all of that. Chesterton said, Christianity fits man's deepest need because it makes him concentrate on joys which do not pass away rather than on the inevitable grief, which is superficial. Grief, pain, suffering, those things are temporary. Joy is eternal. Joy is forever. It makes you physically stronger, emotionally stronger, and it makes you spiritually stronger. In the New Testament, the Greek word, one of the Greek words for strength, kratio, it means in definition, having the upper hand on your enemy. I love this quote from Earl Palmer. He says, joy is baffling to evil and always has been. Nothing is so troubling to the devil as the laughter of joy. It is an insult to the terror and gravity of hell. Evil cannot endure joy because evil is focused inward and also because evil does not have a sense of humor. You wanna give a middle finger to the devil who wants to kill, steal, and destroy in your life? Start laughing. Have some fun, celebrate your God, live with the joy of the Lord. He has no idea what to do with that because he has none of it and he never will. I think that the enemy looks at a joy-filled Christian and goes, I'm not gonna mess with them. I'll go somewhere else. Like, crap, I don't know what to do with you. Whatever I throw at you, you still just stand on the strength of the joy of the Lord. I don't know what to do, so I'll just go somewhere else. So I love worshiping at the Murray unit. 
You walk into a room of women who are in prison, very tough circumstances, and they are on fire, lifting their hands, shouting, praising, living in the joy of the Lord that doesn't make sense with their circumstance. And I think the enemy looks at a woman who's in prison, who's proclaiming the joy of the Lord and goes, I don't know what to do with her. I can't stop her. It's where you start to become untouchable to the enemy when the joy of the Lord is your strength. He has no concept of it. One of the most joyful people I've ever met is a very meek, stoic pastor named Timothy in India. We talk to you guys about him once in a while because you guys support him. And this man lives a very uncommon life. He spends his days in the red light district loving lepers, touching the people that nobody else will, the untouchables, praying with prostitutes, sex slaves, helping kids get out of the red light destiny of sex work and instead getting to live in a home and know Jesus and go to school and have a future. This man lives a very uncommon life and has all kinds of opposition. He emailed me a few weeks ago asking for prayer because there are people who wanna tear down his work, not because it's not good work, but because he's a Christian, facing opposition. And his email, the subject of it, as he's going through this, the subject said, exceeding joy, Psalm 43. Now, Psalm 43 is kind of written in a time when David, who's called the schizophrenic king, he's all over the place. He's like, it's, it's like this God, where are you moment? He's, this dude deals with so much depression and, and struggle and attack. And Timothy can relate to that. He writes, vindicate me, my God, and plead my cause against an unfaithful nation. Rescue me from those who are deceitful and wicked. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Where are you, God? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send me your light and your faithful care. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. I love the Bible because it's so real. He's feeling such pain and struggle right now, but joy can exist there too. And that's what Timothy is clinging to, that David clings to. Verse four is where it shifts. He says, I will go to the altar of God, to God, my joy and my delight. I will praise you, O God, my God. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Here's what I'm gonna do, even though I'm not feeling like it. Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior, and my God. I'm gonna praise him even if I don't feel like it. I'm gonna go to him and know that he's my strength. It's his joy that I have to cling to right now. That's what Timothy's doing. That's, that's a man that I think the enemy looks at and goes, I have no idea how to mess with you. I don't know what to do with you because you will just keep claiming the strength and the joy of God no matter what the world throws at you. And that's the kind of joy, the kind of strength that I want in you, in this church. But you're only gonna experience it. You're only gonna live when you go to the source. God doesn't want you to just feel happy. He wants you to be joyful, to live a life of that. You're probably realizing in your life or have before, your pursuit of happiness is revealing emptiness, but it will be your pursuit of Jesus that reveals joy and fills the joy tank in your life. We just this past week, Casey shared, we had this amazing week for students, Red Rocks youth here and in Denver, our teenagers celebrating God. I got to go up to Denver and share with the kids up there. And, and I tell you, a generation that cynical commentators are saying they're lost, Gen Z, they're already lost. They're hopeless. Man, they don't see nights like this where hundreds and hundreds of teenagers have their hands lifted, praising God, asking the Holy Spirit to rest on them, proclaiming the victory of Jesus. That's what I saw. And after, after the message, we're standing in worship, we're worshiping, and I noticed this kid right by me and he's crying, seventh grader. And he's crying, and then I see these three friends of his, these little middle schoolers, they come together and they pray for him. It was like the sweetest thing. They pray together, and then they walk away and worship keeps going, and so I tap him and I say, hey, what's, what's your name? He says, Isaac. I said, Isaac, are you okay? What's going on right now? And he said, I felt some depression in my life and I've dealt with some stuff. There's some hard things going on. He goes, but I'm not crying right now because of those things. He says, I'm crying tears of joy right now because I feel the joy of God in me right now in worship. And I know the Holy Spirit has a breakthrough for me. And I looked at him, and I was like, why didn't you preach? What am I doing here? <laughs> and I said, Isaac, I'm about to pray for you. Because there is, everybody's special in the room, but you're extra special. You're in seventh grade and you are experiencing the joy of the Lord in the midst of trial in your life. At 12 years old, you are being filled with his strength right now. 
I'm praying an anointing, a filling of joy in your life. So I'm praying for him halfway through, I stop and I start laughing. I go, by the way, did you know that your name means laughter? Isaac is a biblical name that means laughter. I said, there's just a special anointing of joy on your life. And I wanna call that out in you. I wanna speak that to you because I believe your generation, the church needs leaders, people who are so filled with the joy of the Lord that show that strength to the world that people will look at you and go, what is it that you have? I'm trying to get hits of happiness from all the common things, but you live this uncommon life. And even in your trials, you are so full of joy, you're so strong. Isaac, that's the man that you are called to be. And I believe that we, as the generations older than them, we are called to be strong in the joy of the Lord and also to leave a legacy of joy for those generations after us. That they would grow up in churches and see Christians who are filled with the joy of the Lord. It reminded me of this quote by a guy named Earl Palmer. He said, we also owe, we owe the future generation a legacy of joy. We owe it to them. And we owe humor too. He says, humor is the story that joy tells. We owe this to our children because however serious and heavy life is and can become, the greatest truth of all is this, that Jesus Christ, who gave his life for our salvation, is alive. And therefore, the word that pleases us more than all the words, all the other words is joy. Red Rocks Church, would you stand to your feet if you're able? We're gonna worship right now. We are called to be uncommon people living uncommon lives because of our uncommon God with uncommon strength that is rooted in his joy. That's who we're called to be. That's what I want for your life, to leave a legacy of joy. Let it fill you. We're gonna sing a song right now called Sound Mind that we've sung before, our buddy Corey wrote it. And this song is not a list of affirmations that you sing and make happen for yourself. This song is simply agreeing with the word of God and proclaiming it and singing it. It's steeped in Philippians 4. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. I will say it again. Remember when the Bible says something twice, it's doubling down, rejoice. Paul commands joy 15 times in this little letter of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord. And so Corey and I are talking about that scripture that a lot of the verses come from that we just sing and agree with, whether you feel like it or not. And he said, the heart of this song came from reading Psalm 100. He said, Psalm 100 verse four says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. He said, after years of leading worship, what it clicked for me reading this scripture is that it's in the presence of God that we receive joy because he's the source of it. That's where we get filled up. That's why you need to be in the word and worship and repent and celebrate. And he says, this scripture unveils to us that the passwords, so to speak, to get into the presence of God are thanksgiving and praise. And he got super passionate, fired up. He goes, we have reduced thanksgiving to be one day out of the year that we sit around in a circle and go, what are you thankful for? He said, we have reduced praise to be a fast paced worship song we sing at the beginning of a church service. When it's Thanksgiving, a posture of Thanksgiving and praise, just giving God the glory, whether we feel it or not, that access is the presence of God and that is where you receive joy. If you're a person in this room and you're like, man, I'm just not feeling it. I don't open my mouth, I don't sing. You're the exact person right now that needs to just sing out to your God and open your mouth and proclaim his goodness with gratitude, with thankfulness, and praise him for who he is and receive joy. My hope is that people will look at this church and they'll be like, ah, I don't really know what to think of those people. They're so joyful at Red Rocks. Because if that's our reputation, that means we are a freaking strong church, that our strength is rooted in the joy of the Lord. That's the life you're called to, the uncommon life you're called to, uncommon strength, So church, right now as we worship, receive joy.